My name is Luwal Mayen and I'm from South Sudan. How many people know South Sudan? Exactly. So I'm um, from South Sudan and I'm the founder and a game developer for Junoop Game. So Junoop Game is the first ever like um, gaming company in, in South Sudan for, for the first time. Uh, South Sudan got in, independent in 2011. So what we do is um, we use our gaming and video game and mobile game and then some uh, we're working on a card game right now for peace and conflict resolution. So, and that is, uh, you know, that's the most important thing why I actually founded uh, Junoop Game. And some of the people might ask like, uh, why do you use game for peace building? You know, what is the history behind it? So what happened is that uh, South Sudan has been going through so much war since 1983 up to now. So at the end of the day, you see like a lot of people have been destroyed, you know, a lot of refugees and so on. So what happened is that uh, we have like about 2.5 million refugees in, you know, displaced from South Sudan. So I was part of it. Uh, my parents were displaced in 1993 to, to Uganda. So I grew up in Uganda, so in a refugee camp. And then, you know, it, it wasn't easy like living in a refugee camp, but I had a passion in making video games. So I told my mom to buy for me a computer. So she just looked at me and laughed and said like, what is computer? She's not even educated. And where are you going to get the power to, to do what you're doing? So but I told her, like, you know, I have a passion in it and I want to do something for my country. So living in a refugee camp is, it wasn't like we believe that true peace is built over time. You know, South Sudan has been going through a lot of war and a lot of ceasefires have been tried, you know, to restore peace in, in South Sudan. So this actually helped me to, you know, to find out like what is the best way to bridge the gap. Because as I said before, like this is a war that began like long time ago, like 1983. So a lot of children were born in war, they were raised up in war. So their mindset, their attitude, you know, towards peace building, it's, it's all about like war. So I, I decided to use like the video game that can actually help them to, you know, to change their mindset, especially in school. For example, you know, we, we can say, for example, these are tools that can divide the youth, you know, towards each other. For example, like in South, we have about like 64 tribes in the country, and there's a lot of hatred. So how do you bring them together? So I decided to use like the video game to, you know, to, to bridge the gap. For example, we have like 72% of the population in South Sudan is under the age of 30. So like the whole population, this is like, these are the youth. These are people that are used as a tool of war by the, you know, by, by, by the politician in order to fight. So, and since they were born in war, what happened is that you can see like, when child grow up, you see they start like playing with gun, like making gun toy. And at the end of the day, you see like holding a gun. So I decided like, you know, to, in order to change their mindset, I have to introduce like this video game because it can help them like bring them together and love each other and, and so on. So what happened since I grew up in the refugee camp, I started like playing with them when I did my first game in the refugee camp, you can see. Uh, we're playing one of my card game, and children are able to right now play game. So the, the most interesting thing is that uh, when I grew up, I thought that video games are not made by people. It's not people who made video game. So how? Because this is like, since they grew up in the refugee camp, there's nothing that they look up to. It's all about like, go play, and then at the end of the day, they don't go to school because they have nothing that can actually, you know, bridge the gap to each other as the children. So I, I made like three games. So one game is called Salam, Wider, and Head Cup. So Wider, it's a game that helps you to become a peacemaker. Instead, it's like a war game. So what you do is that you have to save people from being killed. So like this helps them like when I said like killing it bad. Like this is, you know, refugees, this is what we have to do. So and then I have the card game called Wider. So this is a game that that's actually teaches them to you know about community togetherness and then you know conflict resolution. So in the game, there's a scene whereby you know when I play a card like about uh, conflict resolution, and then each of each of the person is supposed to ask to, you know 
to, to answer you know, a question about how to solve a certain conflict. So this card game actually helped them a lot in, in bridging each other. So we have been um, getting feedback since I started um, the, the game, like from different people, universities. And here, like he said, like I uh, is an ambassador to to Iraq, and he was saying he, he told me like I love alternative way of bringing youth together. So we have been getting a lot of feedback and feel like this is a good tool to to help the youth. And right now in South Sudan, for the first time, most of the most of the youth are playing video game, and it's helped them like to to bring them together. So that's what I do for. That's why I'm making games. So I make games for peace and conflict resolution. So maybe if you have any question, yeah. Can you give a little more detail about the game itself? What, what sort of questions do people ask and how do they resolve? Oh, that's, 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 that's a good question because um, as I said before, like this is a game that is more of for conflict. So we have, we have designed like um, cuts for like togetherness, cut for conflict. So, but we customize certain um, conflict, uh, you know, question that you can ask as you're playing together. So it depends on like, on, on, the, on the gameplay actually, yeah. How many kids are playing in that's, that's a good one. Um, for the Salam game, uh, we have like 2,000 download right now from Amazon because uh, we, we are part of Amazon startup. They help us to use their cloud computing. So we use that as a, uh, so we are about like 2000 and we distribute it locally because um, internet, it's, it's so hard to like, to, you know, to download mobile game on internet. So we distribute the game like the APK locally to the people. So that's what we're, we're working on. What are some challenges that you face? Challenges, that's, uh, you know, seeing it's, it's the first um, company in South Sudan, there are no a lot of game developers that can work together. And secondly, that like funding, because like it's uh, it's more like, it's, it's so hard sometimes to get funding to something that you know, because these are refugees, these are people in the war, so how would somebody buy a game in a, in a you know, in, in such kind of crisis? Why would you even sell a game to uh, to refugees? And that's, that's, that's a product that's gonna change, so mostly, Collaborating and you know funding sometime, yeah. Uh, what kind of pathways are in place to help other like South Sudanese refugees start learning game development in the refugee camps? Well, that's <laughs> yeah, but you know it's it's all about the passion. But if there are really some people that are a lot of people like are really into it right now, seeing uh, right now. I've been like, I did the first uh, global game jam in South Sudan 2017, and this actually helped them to, to come together, and I actually volunteer and tra train them. And some of them are actually helping me right now in terms of art, something design. So um, if there are really people that are able to provide educational like uh, training for them, that would be like great, like, yeah. Mm. Yes. Wow, uh, you know the first deal like that was like three days ago. Uh, that's when like the the government and the the rebel leader came together, but it, it hasn't reached to the to, to the local like to the to the root to the people. So that's that's the problem. So what I'm trying to target is more like the, the local people, the youth, the children, because like they have been doing like peace deal every time. Like it's not all about the paper, but it's all about like bring them and change the mindset. But it would be great like to to look into that too, yeah. Maybe the last question. Are these games to be played by boys and girls or just Yes. Boys? Yeah, both. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, it's both. Everyone is like playing the games and yeah. Maybe you the last, maybe. Um, yeah, I was curious um, if you have particular strategies to get kids to start playing your games. So it looks like it's relatively easy to, you know, 
So mostly like uh, these children like, you know, what they see matters a lot and if I introduce them in school, so, you know, seeing it's a school, like giving them the game, so it, it's helped them sometimes to, you know, to play the game, like after the break, they can be able to play the game and also the game design, like something that attracts them, like, yeah, to, to play the game. Yeah. So that's all, thank you so much uh, for listening. Okay, so my name is Amanda Warner. Um, I am a learning and game designer. And so I created a game because I was upset about the US presidential election um, in 2016. And so maybe some other people remember that as well. Yeah, a little bit. And so one thing I was very particularly upset about was the amount of false information that I saw swirling around on social media um, leading up to the election. And so I knew I wanted to do something about this, um, but I wasn't exactly sure how to address it. Um, there's lots of reasons that people spread false information. And I decided that the people that I wanted to target with a game were the people who were spreading things because they thought that it was actually true information. And so really, I wanted people to employ a higher level of skepticism, so when they're reading potentially misleading articles, I wanted them to notice when a claim was questionable and fact check it. Because I'm ambition, I also wanted to have them explain to other people um, why and how fake news is distributed, <coughs> and maybe even become advocates in stemming the spread of misinformation. And so with all of this, I was like, well, why isn't this happening already? Why aren't people already doing this? Um, one of the reasons is that fake news sites often look somewhat convincing. Um, people don't necessarily understand if something is real or not. Most of the fake news sites that get lots of hit are set up on WordPress-like templates, so they really aren't that hard to put together. Similarly, even the articles themselves, they might not look particularly realistic to you, but if someone sees something and they see a quote, and they see specific details, and they see a photo, they don't necessarily understand that all of that is super easy to fake, and doesn't actually necessarily mean that whatever was in the article really happened. And they also don't necessarily understand the financial incentives that are out there for creating fake news, um, particularly for people who might live outside of the United States in a country where there's a lower cost of income, and where the money that they can earn from ad revenue goes a lot farther. And so I had pretty ambitious goals for the top. I think I have a laser pointer. Yeah, so I have my two top level goals. But there were other things that I felt like needed to happen um, in order for these higher level things to happen. And so this is an outcome map. And my primary job is more as a learning designer. And for almost every project I do, I create a map like this that really starts out with the high level things that we want to achieve in the world. So those are the two top level goals. And then I map down and look at okay, what needs to happen in order for that to happen? What needs to happen for that? And so that I make sure that I'm addressing these. Um, I've worked on lots of projects, and i found that if I really think through this process and think of all the things that need to happen, what I design um, is so much closer to what really needs to happen in the real world. And so for these, you can see that in order for the top two level things to happen, people also need to believe that fake news does exist. Um, that's becoming easier now, but still is sometimes a question. Um, they need to understand the financial incentives for creating fake news, understand how fake news is written, distributed, identify the, some of these common techniques that people use to spread it. So things like making people angry, appealing to their existing confirmation biases, including partial truths. So all of these things that make things look really convincing, but don't necessarily mean something's legitimate. And so I knew I couldn't necessarily do everything um, that showed up on that outcome map. And so I decided to focus on the items in the bottom, the blue. And I think these really involve understanding what fake news is and how is it, it is spread as a system. So how do we do this? And so as I talked about, I come from more traditional learning design. And I think that especially in that field, we often picture learning happening something like this picture. So people are going to read something or listen to something and poof, it's gonna be magically embedded in their brains ready for them to use later. Um, the problem with this is just reading or listening to something is rarely enough for someone even to remember it later, um, let alone to build skills or change behaviors. 
Um, so I pretty quickly rejected a more traditional learning approach for this and went for something that was more experiential and more game-like. This is a game that's often used in learning in particular. Um, lots of PowerPoint Jeopardy games are created. Um, but the problem I have with games like this is they have very little to do what, with what you want the learner to actually do in the real world. And so maybe if you wanted to learn some basic facts or give people a chance to recall information, this could be a useful way to do it. But it has very little, the mechanics of it. So actually like picking something worth a certain number of points and answering a question, that has nothing to do with what you want the person to accomplish unless you are asking them to like participate in quiz shows later on in the real world. And that's probably not what you're trying to do. So this isn't horrible, but in most cases, I think we can do a lot better. Similarly, these types of games, so kids learning games on the internet. Um, so in this particular game, what you're trying to do is you make that guy go up and down and you collect some letters. Um, as you do this, um, incidentally, you're making some words. However, the actual mechanics, actually what you're doing is just moving the guy up and down. And again, that doesn't have anything to do with literacy or reading or anything like that. And I'm not saying this game is horrible. Um, my six-year-old son would love to play this game. But I think in many cases, again, we can do a lot better. And so I don't want to go down the rabbit hole of talking about exactly what a game is and what a game isn't. But for the purpose of this presentation, I'm going to talk about a game that has this um, goal and then a set of rules that you can use to reach that goal. And so I'm not the first person to make this analogy, but let's go for talking about it in terms of golf. So golf, basically your goal is to get this ball into this hole, right? Yeah. But you can't just put it in the hole. You have to hit it with a stick. And generally you have to do this from some distance away. And there are things in the way. So there's sand traps, there's trees, there's things you have to hit it over. It's not easy. And people will practice for a really long time to develop really good strategies to learn how to better hit that ball into the hole with the stick. And this is the end of my knowledge about golf, so there's probably more nuances. But even without any more knowledge, I know it would be so much easier to pick up that ball and put it into the hole, right? Yeah, but people are willing to spend lots of time on this. They're willing to struggle and learn and practice and spend thousands of hours playing golf to get good at this. And so I think this is why that we as game designers should always be trying to embed the messenger skill into the mechanics because people will spend so much time practicing and playing and trying things that we are missing an amazing opportunity if we aren't having the things that they're struggling with be the things that we want them to take away, be the things that we want them to learn. And I'm not the first person to do this, say this either. And I'm probably not even the first person like in this room to say this. But I think it's so important that it's worth repeating because I think a lot of times we miss opportunities to make games that really challenge players with the mechanics with what we want them to learn. Okay, so this is back to my outcome map. No more golf, completely out of my league there. Um, so I really wanted to build a game that addressed those blue items at the very bottom. And so I decided to have the players make fake nukes. And this is how I was going to accomplish this. Because if they have a goal of making money, then they're going to understand the financial incentives of making fake news. If as they're doing this, they're creating articles that use some of these common techniques, then they're going to be more likely to spot them in the real world. And so this is just going to be some quick screenshots from the game, because I don't think I have time to actually um, demo it. Um, but I started out the game as if you are a person in another country who doesn't necessarily care about the United States election, um, but who sees an opportunity to profit from it. And this is um, based on real life. Um, a lot of the people who targeted um, the United States with fake news leading up to the election um, were in Macedonia. Um, and they didn't care about who won necessarily. I mean, most of the sites were pro-Trump, but they weren't pro-Trump. They were just like, hey, this is an opportunity to make some money. This is a business venture for us. And so I set it up as if you're a teenager who just wants to earn some money, and you might get some music equipment, a deposit for your first apartment, or a used car. And so you start by setting up a site. And so you create a name, you select hosting, you see how relatively cheap and easy it is to really go through this process of setting everything up. And then you learn that you're going to be profiting from ad revenue. And 
I think this is a really important point that um, various surveys and studies have found people don't actually understand necessarily how the internet is monetized, and so understanding this is super valuable. To start your site, you copy articles from other fake news sites, because this also absolutely happens. And then you have to select some social media profiles that you can either create them yourself or you can buy existing profiles, but it's more convincing. Both of these things also absolutely happen. And then you select a group to spread it to. And you can select any group you want to put it in, but if you're selecting things that are more politically close to what the article already is or fit with what people believe, your article is absolutely going to be better. Again, all reflecting reality. So after you spread your article, you get to see what everyone thinks about it. Um, so I think this article, yes, it triggered anger and disgust. So that's good for our purposes. We got lots of likes, we got lots of shares. And then all of this translates into views, which translate into ad revenue. So it's again, all tying back to the goal of your goal is to make money. Later on in the game, you have the option to write your own article. And so here you start out with a base, so something that is popular right now. Maybe something is actually true, and you're just going to twist it to make it seem more dramatic. And you get to select some of these techniques that we talked about earlier that can be used to build drama, to believe the believability, blah, 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 to build believability. And again, all of this is with the idea that these are the things that happen in real life. So if you see an article later on that has a photo, maybe you'll do a reverse image search, or maybe at least you won't think to yourself, oh, it's a photo, it must be real. The game is mostly about fake news system rather than impact, but it does touch on impact a little bit in the feedback. And so here, if you have a really popular article about certain people being dangerous, you might find out that hate crimes have gone up as inside groups. And so I try to leave in some of the impact with it as well. Now people, as they're doing this, can pick to spread any type of articles they want. So they could pick things about like cute kittens on the internet. But there's a series of intermediate goals and financial incentives that really nudge you to creating these politically divided sites and really spreading it among groups that are more likely to already believe what you're doing. So again, all of this is so that people have a sense of this is what happens in the real world. Maybe when I'm seeing this in my group, this is being pushed at me because they believe I already have these existing beliefs. Okay, I can't remember why I put this slide in because I don't have my notes, but I think it comes back to the outcome map. That's how the outcome map of I tried to weave everything in blue into what I was doing. Now, impact, I think, is really important with any um, social impact games, like actually measuring what you're doing. And I don't have a way of telling um, exactly what people do after the game. Um, it was released in March of 2017, and since then, over 100,000 people from 170 countries have played it. Um, most of the time when I get emails about the game is from teachers, and so it's being used a lot in classrooms um, from middle school to college. So a lot of times they will play it um, individually, the students well, and they'll get together and discuss it and debrief. And from what I've heard, it's been a great tool for sparking these discussions about how things spread, why, um, what you're doing on the internet. So I'm excited to unleash that. I wasn't actually picturing students when I built it, and I think that's the primary audience that it's hit on. Oh, it's also, there's a PhD student who I'm working with to potentially study the impact for one, but we'll see what happens. But this is the game, so you can play it. It's available in English, then it was also recently translated into German, if you happen to speak German. Um, and I also have little cards that have the URL on them, so you can get them from me um, after the presentation. But I would be happy to take any questions, if anyone has any. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I would definitely say this is a simulation style game. Um, so it definitely, I mean, so simulations and games, I feel like simulations are trying to get as close as they need to be to reality. And this in many ways I was trying to get close to reality, but you don't have to go through like all the steps you need to do in real life to do everything here. Um, and there's more, yeah, it's more abstracted version of reality. But, yeah. So as a, as a teacher, and especially as a teacher, like Literacy is really important to, to you know, using these machines that you might be up with. And of course. When you were when you first started, I totally at first was like, she's gonna create a series of fake web pages, and then we're gonna decipher which ones are credible and which ones are not. Mm -hmm. I like this route, and I think it's a better route. Mm -hmm. What what was the process like? Why was your first kind of 
attempt at this or thoughts about it was like to create a series, take new sites and then decipher why they are, you know. Yeah, absolutely. So that was my first thought on like sort of the best way. I mean, because that, that's what I want people to do in the real world, right? Is to be able to distinguish between fake and not fake. But I don't think it's as interesting as a route. And I wanted to build a game that people would enjoy playing and that people would share with their friends and that lots of people would come see. And I think that for that, this was better. Um, I also think that understanding, really understanding why someone might do something like this, so the motivations and sort of the intricacies of how they go about it, I feel like that's really helpful in building skepticism. And so I think that this is probably a better way to do that as well. Um, but there are games that take the other route, and I think they're good too. So I think it just depends what you're trying to do. Yes. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry, you do two minutes, right? You go ahead. So just following up on my question, that any of the people who work at Jack, which is one of the most famous games, uh, showed improved like, skills that could have been acquired in you know, another subject or in you know, other things that they were doing? Yep, so not yet. So we haven't formally studied it yet. So all I have so far is the teacher's observations and what they tell me about it. Um, but um, that's something that we're, I'm looking at potentially studying soon. I have a PhD student who's interested in working with me. So and those observations suggest um, so the observations suggest that people are very engaged with it, that afterwards they have good discussions about sort of what spreads on the internet and what doesn't and why people do things. I don't know that it spreads to other subjects. Um, I don't know if that's been, been considered. So generally good. I get people writing to me a lot asking when I'm going to implement this feature of the game that I've never implemented, that it just says, like, this is lost for now. So I get a couple emails about that every week. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm doing other things. Um, but it's been generally positive. I definitely have had people um, sort of, I, I got a lot of press about two weeks after I released it because it was just a hot topic at that point in time. And definitely people were like, oh, are you training people to make fake news? And there were lots of, like, worries around that. And so I'd say those the negative reactions have been mostly about that, but it's been generally positive about it as a game, and most people think it's a good thing to do, so. Yeah. Have, have you had some feedback from people who use this, experienced it, and then have discovered some fake news and, and let you know? Yeah, I haven't had anyone come to me and say that, hey, I have used this and therefore avoided this article, yeah. but that would be super interesting to look at and, and know. Have, have you yourself uh, develop any guidelines or have you seen some characteristics of fake news that are sort of uh, giveaways? Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, it, it's hard because there's no like one giveaway because it can be pretty sophisticated and other times it's like there's things like typos and there's things like this um, URL is clearly not a, a legitimate URL. So, I mean, sometimes it's more giveaway than others. There's some good guides online that I can definitely like look at, I might even link to in the about me, about the page, about the game, but yeah. Yeah, no problem. Okay, uh, I think I'm being called to wrap up, so thank you everyone. Uh, cool, hi everyone. Um, I'm super happy to follow two amazing uh, presentations. Um, and Amanda, I definitely wanna check out uh, Fake It To Make It. Um, so I'm gonna talk about something a little bit different. Um, so I am uh, wanna talk in the briefest possible way today about how AI and specifically tools which use AI techniques, and more specifically than that, natural language understanding techniques, can have a positive impact on both the games that we're able to make and also the ways in which the in which we can interact with each other within games. Um, so just to introduce myself, uh, I'm Mitu Kandeka. I'm an indie game designer and developer, particularly of kind of social simulation games. Uh, I consult on a variety of technical and creative projects across games, AI, and immersive storytelling. I'm also a, a professor at NYU at the uh, Game Center. Um, but in addition to all of that, I was also one of the co-founders of a company called Spirit AI. Um, and broadly speaking, our mission with Spirit AI was to use AI and to create AI tools um, to make games and other things as well, everyday interactions, more accessible and compelling for everyone, for as many people as possible. Um, so to that end, there are kind of two 
uh, very different sounding ways that um, two diff different sounding project, project, projects or products, I suppose, uh, that we do that. Um, but you'll see kind of how they're connected and how ultimately they're underpinned by this idea of really understanding language, right, and really understanding the things that we say when we're kind of interacting within games. So firstly, uh, we make tools to help developers craft more expressive characters and stories in games and VR and AR and beyond as well. So one of those things is through uh, this tool that we make called Character Engine, um, which is basically an authoring tool in SDK. And what it is, is it's designed for people who aren't necessarily like AI programmers, um, but are more people who are writers and narrative designers and people who are interested in just creating stories and creating characters to be able to do so and create these characters who are able to basically improvise within a sort of narrative scenario that you create. Um, so through that tool, you can sort of create these characters who will really understand players and the language that they're using. So if it's like natural input, whether it's a game about typing or a game where you use voice input, etc. And I'll go into some examples. Um, or even if it's in the fully fledged like um, VR environment, it's really about being able to sort of take that and understand what the player is saying and their kind of you know, all the context around it and actually sort of respond to that and um, uh, sort of uh, based, on, based on all of this context. So characters have a memory of where a conversation's gone so far and they know what they want to say to you in response from their sort of possibility space um, and can draw dynamically from all of that. Uh, and they can exa decide exactly how to phrase all of those things. Um, so if you've made the character angry because you're, uh, you've been being mean to them persistently, uh, they, their responses will maybe be more sort of curt. Uh, if they're nervous, maybe they'll add lots of disfluencies like ums and ahs, uh, and maybe emphasize different words differently. And all of that depends on the specific character that you as sort of the author or writer have designed. Um, so, it's really designed to um, be able to uh, help writers, narrative designers, craft characters for all kinds of situations. Um, here's a uh, in-house demo uh, made by the Spirit team earlier this year, kind of showing how responses are formulated. So uh, we basically made this sort of Westworld type interface, which is showing kind of how uh, a character is understanding what is being said by the player and then sort of choosing uh, or generating what to say in response. Um, so it's really about making the player aware of the state of the character, aware of sort of what's been understood at any given time, and really giving them the feeling of being understood, right? That's kind of what we want. We want that sort of connection with characters. Um, now, all of that is to say that, or I think all of this is really important because it enables various kinds of games and interactions which utilize people's kind of existing mental models, right, of how to interact with others, essentially. Like, you know, I think one thing that we all have, even if we don't have a specific set of game literacies, is an idea of how to talk to each other, right? And fair enough, people might have different ideas of that, but this is something, this is the type of interaction that enables. Um, so using uh, sort of natural language understanding, this can kind of underpin types of interfaces which people are already familiar with. So one example might be uh, like we have an existing mental model of communicating or texting with our friends via our phones, right? So what if you had games in which um, you're sort of texting with these fictional characters? Um, obviously, there are some really great existing examples of games which do that um, in various ways now. Um, what I think is really compelling about a game like Bury Me, My Love, which I know has been talked about here at the conference already, um, is what, that the story kind of plays out over pseudo real time, right? So you have this short burst of back and forth with um, with the characters and you know it's not until you or you know the real you might be busy doing something else that you get a response back from uh, back from no the person you're talking to um, so it kind of perfectly takes advantage of the relationship that we have with our phones and with the ways that we just kind of um, you know have these devices on us um, and you know and and really just taking advantage of the ways that we're used to connecting with people that we care about um, I mentioned very briefly voice interfaces. So, um, you know, if we have uh, games which use natural language understanding, we can also use voice input. And obviously, personal assistants are, and this is a whole other topic, informing how a whole generation of kids are growing up interacting with computers, right? Um, so, 
I've talked about all this and this idea of how uh, we can use natural language understanding and AI techniques around that to really uh, improve the relationships that we have with in-game characters. But um, at Spirit, when we were sort of thinking about all these problems and sort of doing R&D around really understanding the player, we were also very conscious of, well, you know, if we're able to understand um, conversations uh, between well, a conversation that you're having with a character in this really nuanced way, then what about looking at conversations between players, right? Um, so what we also do is tackle the uh, not small problem of uh, trying to help community managers mitigate harassment and toxicity in games and online platforms. Um, so basically, we have this tool called Ally. Um, which is designed to do just that, to help combat online harassment in games um, and other social platforms as well. So anywhere there is kind of chat, right, between real people. Um, and then really trying to understand um, when an interaction or a conversation is problematic, right? Um, I'm trying to understand when someone is being harassed because there's all kinds of contextually specific nuanced things that go into that. Um, and so this is a thing where really using AI techniques and using very nuanced natural language understanding is important because looking out for just specific problematic terms isn't helpful, right? Because you sort of need to understand the social context behind what's been going on. So for, for example, if I'm playing um, a game with my best friend, she might call me all kinds of names, but if the same, if like a total stranger uses the same words, that's not okay, right? So it really is about um, this idea of consent, right? And a lot of language is really about consent. Um, what is the language that we consent to in various scenarios? Um, so this is, again, um, an example where looking for specific words isn't helpful. One example of like a uh, sort of a design pattern, because a lot of this is really about design and also understanding the problem space, um, is sort of looking at when someone is, um, you know, finds an interaction to be problematic, but there hasn't been any kind of keyword or anything that's been flagged up. It's just that someone has expressed that they are upset in response to something that's been said. So that's an instance of something we might look for, right? Because we're not just looking for specific words. It's, okay, something has happened where this was definitely like a non-consensual interaction. And that's something that we might flag up to a community manager. Um, so that's kind of a broad overview of that. Um, another quick sort of thing I want to mention while we're talking about all this. Um, so it really is about, yes, using AI techniques, trying to sort of train models of understanding language, but it's also about conscientious application of that, right? So one of the things that um, is important is also trying to understand the language a community, a specific community uses, because no two communities are the same, and there's all kinds of different communities where language is used in different ways. And it's really about understanding that, and again, understanding the problem space, um, and applying these things in a really conscientious way. Um, overall, all of this is ultimately about using AI to alleviate the emotional labor of dealing with toxicity, right, moderation. Um, so there's all kinds of obviously broader conversations around sort of AI and labor and stuff. And honestly, I think that emotional labor and instances where maybe we don't have to do that emotional labor is one thing that AI can really help us with, both for those who are being targeted by problematic language and, um, and harassment and toxicity, and also for those whose job it is day in, day out to sort through and moderate those instances. Um, Okay, so that's the sort of two projects that we've been working on in brief. Hopefully it gives you um, an overview of how AI and particularly the power of AI to understand language and context can be used to make games and interactions uh, more accessible and compelling for everyone. Thank you very much. So uh, my name is Jim Monroe. I've come here from Toronto, Canada um, to uh, talk about uh, the Game Arts International Network. Uh, I've made a bunch of games, uh, including a game called Unmanned about UAV drone pilots. That was uh, the people here at Games for Change were nice enough to give a couple of awards to a few years ago. Uh, but I'm probably better known for being one of the founders for the Hand Eye Society, which is a video game arts organization in Toronto and was actually uh, the first video game arts organization. Now you might be asking yourself, what is a video game arts organization? What are the video game arts? Um, well, basically, uh, we defined it as supporting games that were made primarily for creative expression. Uh, and that might be, uh, might have commercial uh, motivations as well, but the primary motivation is, uh, is creative. Uh, and that's what makes us different from industry groups, uh, even when our goals align with theirs 
and we work together. One of the things we wanted to assert was that video games deserve the support that arts organizations and other mediums received. Uh, film, animation, music, they all have arts organization to support artists. Um, and while we started doing that, we were no, by no means alone. There were collectives like Baby Castles here in, in New York, Copenhagen Game Collectives, and many others all across uh, the world. And they've, they've all appeared in the, in the near decade since uh, the Hand-Eye Society was, has been in operation. So while, while at the Hand-Eye Society, I got to know some of these 40 plus entities uh, operating uh, with an arts and culture focus. Um, some of them were registered not-for-profit groups like ours. Uh, some were artist collectives. Uh, some had physical spaces. And some were pop-up exhibitions or festivals. Um, but we had way more similarities and differences. We're all fighting the same cultural bias against games as our form. Uh, the way that games are looked at as a, as a singular, action-based, violence-based uh, uh, sort of form. And uh, we want to uh, sort of show the world the diversity of those games. Um, we want to uh, figure out how to diversify our actual communities um, so that we're not as straight white male as uh, we have been in the past. Uh, and we want to build partnerships that improve the impact that we have in our, in our local communities. So when I could, when I was working in this regional Toronto context, I uh, shared as much as I could the models that, that had worked for us. One of them was a game literacy program called Game Curious. And uh, that ended up being able to be run in, in Montreal and Vancouver as well. Um, and in the process of working with different groups, I discovered that there were common patterns and common challenges that, that I was sometimes able to help uh, these people uh, in diff different areas with, and they were able to help us with. So when I stepped away from the Hand-Eye Society at 2017, the end of 2017, I continued talking with my international game arts peers. And it struck me that while they were offering lots of support to hundreds or even thousands of game artists in their areas, uh, they themselves didn't have much support. Um, traditional arts funders often didn't understand what they were doing, uh, and most of them are self-taught without any sustainability models or roadmap to follow. So I decided to establish a network that would encourage more interconnection and resource sharing amongst these groups. So we're very, currently a very modest uh, undertaking. Um, we're looking for partners and funding right now, uh, but currently it's entirely run on volunteer power. Um, we started out very modestly with, um, with a, a podcast called Microphone Gain, um, which basically does the simple work of putting together someone who has knowledge in a certain area with someone who doesn't have knowledge in a certain area, and get them to talk and record the conversation so that it can be used, uh, for, for useful for uh, numbers of people in the future. For example, our first session was about managing succession and replacing key people, which is a big issue. Uh, burnout is like probably the top uh, issue amongst uh, grassroots uh, arts organizations and arts projects. So we had Tanya X. Short from the Pixels talking to Ben Esposito from uh, LA's Glitch City, a co-working uh, space there. Uh, and they were able to, to, to share and, and, um, and sort of you know, build up their knowledge. Uh, and that was recorded. Um, Another session we ran was called uh, Creating Welcoming Spaces for Underrepresented Groups. Again, addressing some of the diversity of the, of the lack of diversity in, in uh, regional game communities. Um, because once, once things get started and there is a little bit more diversity, it, it, it tends to kind of encourage more uh, people to, of, of different uh, backgrounds to make games. Now, these are just very modest, remote sharing type of uh, projects. They're, they're um, you know, basically, I put the people together on Skype, and we were able to record their conversations. Um, but we've also heard that people are uh, very interested in meeting in person. And as you know, with these types of conferences, there's a lot of value in that. So in partnership with Game On El Arte del Luego Festival in Argentina, uh, we're doing our first Game Arts International Assembly next year in Buenos Aires, or Gaia, as, as, it, as we call it. Um, Gaia will be a small think tank, but each of these organizers will bring back their knowledge and inspiration to hundreds of people back home, and we feel the impact will be significant with that. So I don't like to talk too much about what we could do or you know, what we plan to do, but I thought I'd mention it a little bit. 
Um, there's some things up here that are um, are very interesting, uh, and and as as we sort of as our capacity grows, as our partnerships grow, we hope to be able to take on some of these. Um, there's really the, there's an enormous potential to have more ambitious undertakings. Um, maybe even getting into the kind of cultural advocacy that I met, mentioned earlier that sort of looks at um, some of the politically motivated scapegoating, scapegoating of games um, that's been happening. It happened recently with uh, Trump's uh, White House sort of putting out two minutes of violence. And Games for Change did a, a great response to that. Games, of, I think, uh, two minutes of beauty in games, um, which I thought was amazing. And I really find that, I think that's more of that that can go on. We know the scapegoating will continue as it has gone for decades at this stage. Um, so being prepared for it potentially with uh, resources and, and actual to add something to the debate um, would, be, uh, would be really uh, beneficial for everybody. Um, because when one, one of us in these regions gets people to think differently about games, whether it be through a, you know, a, a queer um, you know, collection of games that are, that are uh, you know, put together by local grassroots people like in, in New York, um, you know, or, or um, you know, people doing uh, games that uh, have educational uh, components to them. Uh, they get people to think differently about games and not in a singular way. Um, so I think that's uh, an important, uh, important mission to sort of uh, look, to, look to combat together um, because uh, basically we all benefit when when people think differently about games. And uh, our little, my little tagline for, I'll leave you with, is a gain for one is a gain for all. So um, thank you very much for listening. And, uh, and please drop a line uh, if you'd like to get involved. Uh, I have some materials up here. I'd love to chat to people in whatever capacity as a partner or as a regional arts organization or as a person that's uh, looking to connect people in their area that need support with other people in other areas. Thanks very much.